The scripture lesson this morning is a continuation of last week's scripture found in Matthew chapter 10, and we pick up at verse 40. Hear the word of God. Those who receive you receive me, and those who receive me receive the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Any, anyone who receives a righteous one because they are a righteous person will receive a righteous one's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because they are my disciple, I tell you the truth, they will certainly not lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Our Lord, our God, we come before you and open ourselves to your word. We listen for what it is that you have for us this day, that it might continue to change and transform our lives into the people that you have called us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A cold cup of water to these little ones. Sheesh, I know more than a few people who would not give me a cold cup of water in the middle of a hot desert. And I wonder if that is how these first listeners to Matthew's gospel account were feeling. They were believers in the good news, disciples of the teachings of Jesus Christ, followers of the way, many who began already as outcasts, others who joined the ranks of outcasts by their choice to accept the grace of God through faith in his son. How were they feeling as they were being called to be disciples, as they were being called to be missionaries of God? Matthew reminds his audience that even the very first disciples faced scorn, rejection, discrimination, and the like. And while Jesus had equipped them with tremendous gifts and powers to heal the sick, to raise the dead, and to drive out demons, they were to expect inhospitable conditions as they continued to share the gospel they might not only be outcasts but vulnerable to arrests trials of all sorts even persecution unto death and now this next generation of disciples might expect the same that is one recruitment plan. Jesus knows that it is a perilous world, that our lives are fraught with disappointment and sometimes danger. But he also knows that this is not the last stop. This is not all that there is. That our full inheritance still waits for us. And that as disciples, we can enjoy a glimmer of that gracious gift now through our acts of welcome and hospitality and charity. The disciples... Understand that the key to a life fulfilled is not hidden, but accessible to those who imitate the life of Christ. So Jesus wants us to know the importance 
of hospitality and welcome. He says to his disciples, as you go out to share the gospel, you might not be welcomed. You may not be treated well, but this does not mean that you can do the same to others. Instead, you are encouraged to practice radical hospitality. And in doing so, you will receive your reward. In Jesus' day, hospitality was already radically different than what we imagine and practice today. No friend and few strangers were ever turned away when they arrived at your home, regardless of the time of day. When visiting friends and family, you were never expected to stay at the Persian suites with the complimentary fish fry. No, you were put up in the home of your host, no matter how many air mattresses it took to accommodate your clan. I know that many in our congregation this summer feel like they are already practicing radical biblical hospitality as their homes have been transformed into temporary bed and breakfasts for a stream of visiting friends and relatives. Many in our congregation as well have traveled to distant lands either as tourists or missionaries and have observed a variety of customs that are practiced in foreign lands. It is interesting to note that even in the impoverished areas of Tijuana, Mexico, where we build homes, there are relatively few truly living on the streets. In fact, in over 25 years of going to Mexico frequently, I would be hard-pressed to think of a time when I saw someone sleeping on the streets, truly homeless. Many families indeed sleep in cardboard and pallet shacks that do little to shield them from the elements, and most families cram dozens of people in spaces smaller than our living rooms, three and four people sharing a double-sized bed, but no one is left out. What little they have is shared with those who are in need. That, to me, is radical biblical hospitality. Radical biblical hospitality often goes a step further than just opening your home or offering assistance. Radical biblical hospitality happens when the host relinquishes control. Think about it. When do you feel most comfortable at home? When you are in control or when someone else is? Several times our family has had the privilege of hosting Senor Lupe's family at our home, but I will never forget the very first time that we had them come and stay for a visit. I had worked like a dog getting the house ready, kicking our kids out of their rooms to make room for his family of six that we would be hosting. We had all the rooms prepared for them, and then they still ended up sleeping all six in one spare bedroom. I changed the linens. I stocked up on food and beverage. I was making things just so. That first night, we planned to barbecue hamburgers, and not just the Costco frozen patty hamburgers, but hand-formed hamburgers. So while I was in the kitchen being in charge of the dinner, Lupe and his family came in. They came into the kitchen to observe my preparations. I was in charge. I knew what I was doing. But no, no, Lupe had a better way. 
I politely replied that I did not need assistance, but he insisted on showing me how to make a hamburger press out of two small plates. By relinquishing control, I learned something new, and our guests felt more at home. Later, during their trip, we planned a visit to Disneyland, and I could not wait to show Lupe all my favorite rides and attractions. We had it all planned like locals, which rides to go first to beat the lines, which places to eat, what to see. But the minute we entered those gates, my perfectly planned and controlled schedule was abandoned. As Lupe and his family explored Disneyland as first timers and ended up opening our eyes to things that we had never noticed before in the Magic Kingdom. By the end of the day, we had probably ridden maybe two rides that I had put on the itinerary, but I never had a better day at Disneyland seeing it fresh through the eyes of a first-timer, I again had relinquished control. This really made me stop and think. Stop and think about the roles of the host and the guest and how, as hosts, it's really not that hospitable to insist on being in control. I tried to think about it through the eyes of someone who is chronically homeless in our communities, someone who is wholly dependent on the generosity of others. We sometimes get offended when a homeless person rejects our offers of food because they don't like it or because they seem to just be wanting money. But can you imagine never getting to choose what you want to eat? The homeless that we serve through Mercy House and other organizations are always at the mercy of what others prepare for them. They do not have the means to choose what they shall eat, Benevolence is always dictated to them. And after a while, this might not seem so hospitable. The radical biblical hospitality that Jesus is calling us to can be found in even the littlest gesture, even in giving a cup of cold water. We often imagine discipleship as requiring huge sacrifice or involving great accomplishments. And sometimes that is exactly what discipleship becomes. But at other times, Jesus seems to say it's nothing more than giving a cold cup of water to someone in need or offering a hug to someone who is grieving, or a listening ear to someone in need of a friend, or offering a ride to someone without a car, or, or volunteering at a local food bank, or making a donation to agencies like the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, or Make-A-Wish, or Chef Bruno's Katarina's Club, or, or you get the idea. Discipleship doesn't have to be heroic. Like all small acts of devotion, tenderness, and forgiveness that go largely unnoticed, but are the things that we do to tend to the relationships that are most important to us. So also, the life of faith is composed of a thousand small gestures. Except that, according to Jesus, there is no small gesture. Anything 
done in faith and love has cosmic significance for the ones involved and indeed for the world that God loves so much. You probably know, as well as I do, Lauren Isley's story of the star thrower. The one about the guy who's on the beach and he's throwing starfish after starfish back into the sea. And when he's asked why by a passerby, he replies that if they don't get back into the water soon, they'll dry up and die. The passerby looking at the beach, it was strewn with a thousand starfish. And he responds that this guy can't possibly hope to make any difference. To which he says, and this is the famous closing line, to the ones I throw back, it makes all the difference in the world. Exactly. Because Jesus has promised to come in time to redeem all love, to fix all damage, to heal all hurts, and to wipe the tears from every eye. Because he has promised to do that, we, in the meantime, can devote ourselves to acts of mercy and deeds of compassion, small and large, not trying to save the world, that's Jesus' job. But simply trying to care for the little corner of the world in which we have been placed. And so even a cold cup of water can make a huge and unexpected difference to those whom we give it to. And according to Jesus, such acts have eternal and cosmic consequences. Jesus is not only teaching us about radical biblical hospitality, but also reminding us that the church is the sent church. Jesus sends his disciples to participate in his mission of proclaiming in word and deed the good news of God's kingdom drawing near. Mission is not just a program at Canyon Hills Presbyterian Church, but it is the defining, defining purpose of everything we do at church. We might not all be called to be wandering missionaries, depending on others for shelter and support. But that does not mean that we are not all called to the mission work of the church. We are all sent to share the good news to others. What would happen if we stopped expecting people to come on their own to us, on their own initiative through our church doors, but instead looked seriously at our call to bring the gospel to them. Remember that cold cup of water. The church is the sent church. We imagine that CHPC is right here. But really, CHPC is everywhere that we are. We represent the church every day in our homes, workplace, on the freeway, grocery store, mall, in Target, the Angels game, the theater, Bowers Museum, the Nixon Library, Africa, India, China, Costa Rica, and Hawaii, and everywhere else that we are or will be or have been. G CHPC is called to stretch beyond the borders of Fairmont and Santa Ana Canyon Road and to be the church wherever we are. To stop living in the shadow of Hibachi Steakhouse and instead live in the reflection of the cross. We have the means to share the gospel in ways both big and small. Because even in 
the small acts of devotion, tenderness, and forgiveness. We are making a cosmic difference and living out radical biblical hospitality, even in a cold cup of water. Amen.